queen. It's a very long story. I'm trying to make it shorter. So anyway, the, when my when I went there, the first time I took a crew, um, a, a videographer and, and a sound engineer and a filmmaker, to uh, who was a self-taught volunteer uh, filmmaker, to make a document the first of a 10-part documentary um, by interviewing the older of the two brothers that were still left. Oh. So um, my daughter realized that she was pregnant, so she and her husband requested that we, you know, my husband and I take them with us uh, the following Christmas because they knew that they wouldn't be able to travel much after the baby came. So, uh, and we complied. Well, when we got there, the older brother, who was the head of the family at that point, um, gave both my daughter and I identical pin, lapel pins. And, I mean, you know, it's not some fabulously expensive, but it's gold and it has little stones. And, um, and it's, it's wonderful, you know, I, I treasure it, you know, when I wear it because I know it came from, I mean, these people saved their lives and then they give us jewelry on top of it. You know? It's amazing. But I have also some other things that I, I got from the people that rescued my brother. Um, later, after yeah. it was, was over. Wow. All right. I'm going to start with my first few, the name that you were born with, your full name. Um, I was, um, I'm Yolanda Avram, that's Abraham in Greek, um, and my last name is Willis, but that's my married name. And, um, where was I born? Yeah, when and where were you born? I was born in Salonika or Thessaloniki, Greece. And I was born in October 2, 1934. And so how old does that make you now? I'm 80 and a half. <laughs> and Yolanda, what is your um, religious identity? I'm Jewish. How many siblings do you have? I, I had only one sibling, four years younger than I was, and when he was about 52 or 53, um, he died. So that was a very hard blow because um, he was younger than I was. It was very hard to accept the fact that he had, in fact, he had been dead for several days in his apartment. But, and the only way they realized that he wasn't, something was wrong, is that they couldn't shove any more mail under his door. It, it just wouldn't go forward. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, can you give us a brief summary of your experiences, your story during the war? I know brief and summary don't really go with stories during the war, but... <laughs> um, well, I was one of the lucky ones. I was a hidden child. and. You know the very famous hidden child, Anne Frank. Mm -hmm. um, but I was not hidden in an attic or a bunker. I was, uh, we were hiding in plain sight, passing as Christians. My entire family used the same trick, whether we were with each other or like there came a time when things got so dangerous, 
my parents decided to give my brother and myself to, to different Christian families so that we, if they, get, they kept getting recognized and they were afraid that they, we would be caught with them and then we would be lost. Now, of course, nobody knew um, at that time exactly what happened to the children when they went to Poland or any of that, but they didn't suspect that it would be great. So, My uh, experience was first being rescued by the people in Crete, a family in Crete, which took as we were from the age of two and a half, my brother was two and a half, suffering from amoebic dysentery, and he cried all the time, which was very dangerous for the rest of the group, um, to a 79-year-old grandmother who was diabetic. And uh, in between, my father was the only guy the only men, and uh, the women were urban ladies that didn't have even the appropriate attire for this kind of climbing, uh, partly on foot, in, on goat paths to the, to the uh, mountain and near the town we had first taken refuge in Crete. We were hoping to go from Crete to Egypt as the royal family and uh, the government had done. So uh, my experience was one of, of rescue essentially, of righteous people that took me in after the family dispersed to protect the children as you know, my brother and myself. Um, I was first um, pretending to be a goddaughter in Greek. In the Greek language, the word for goddaughter is baptismal daughter. And the parents are baptismal parents, the godparents. And so it was a perfect cover for it implied Christianity, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and it was not unusual in those days for somebody to come from an underfed family to a family that had a little bit more food and to hide with, with them. So I was supposed to come from a, a distant town and, uh, and I was the baptismal daughter to my godparents, my baptismal parents. They had a little girl two years younger than I was, and they risked their, her life for us, for me. At one point, my parents had been in a very difficult situation, and they, they found themselves homeless because they were held up at gunpoint by some freelancing um, collaborators and a German, uniformed German soldier who were really looting them. But then they figured if they stayed put, they, they would be denounced for a reward to the SD and, and they would be lost. And so they didn't stay put. They, my mother asked the ringleader, can you give me some of my money um, so we can take a jitney to the to the city in the morning. And he threw her some of her own money. And my father and so-called godfather were working together, moonlighting, in a pasta factory, uh, trying to make ends meet. This was not a wealthy family that took me in. They just didn't have enough money from their a neighborhood bakery, not a pastry shop, a bread shop, uh, to support themselves. And so they went to, um, they uh, 
However, knowing what had happened to my parents, my godparents invited them to join the household where I was hiding. Now, they could not stay overnight because there were terroristic um, raids in households to make sure that everybody who was present was already registered with the authorities. So they, um, they went, the two young men who worked in the bakery, um, my godparents, my godfather's brother, and another man who had been the uh, baptismal sponsor of their little girl, family's little girl, uh, accompanied my parents and the, the baby to an, a distant home that my godparents owned. And I have no idea why they couldn't stay there all the time, why they had to be where I was living. I think it had something to do with maybe the household was very uncomfortable. There was no food there. They couldn't cook, maybe. They, I don't know the reason. But every night before curfew, they disappeared. And every morning after curfew was up, they showed up. And they spent the day. I mean, they even, you know, they, they told jokes. They had a little bit of, of uh, some delicacy, like some pickled fish, uh, like a herring type um, fish. Uh, they, um, they had a, a drop of wine once in a while, and they just enjoyed the conversation and the company of each other. And it was wonderful, but every night I had to hide even from myself the worry that would they be back the next day? Because as soon as a Jewish person rounded the corner, they could have been caught and never been seen again. I had no idea. And every morning I wondered, will they show up again? And one day they didn't. And the reason was that my godfather got a warning from a very good Greek man who knew my father, and he said to him, have you rented your, your downstairs to a Jew? I, I said, what are you talking about? Well, I see this man coming and going from your house every day. He says, oh, you mean uh, George Liberopoulos? <laughs> He's not Jew. We worked together in the pasta factory. Manolis Emmanuel was my rescuer. Manolis, this man was the president of the Jewish community in Larissa when I was stationed there before my military transfer in Athens. He says, watch out, there's a lot of talk in the neighborhood, you may be in trouble. That very same day, my godfather said, I sent your parents and the boy to my brother, the tailor, in another distant neighborhood, and they disappeared from where we were. And that's how, through a series of rescues, one after the other, my parents survived. He, they didn't stay with his brother very long, but you know, they were given enough time to regroup and figure something out and to place my little brother with another family that took him in and kept him for 13 months from when he had just gotten to be five years old to when he was um, a little over six. He stayed with them. And never wanted to come home again. He, he, of course he did, but he was 
in constant battle with my mother because I guess he believed they had gotten rid of him. It was incredible. First of all, we never had the stable homes since his memory of our life. Um, we were always refugees in his, in his young life. And he didn't understand what was going on and why he was suddenly found himself with this wonderful family. He got so attached to them and they to him. He didn't want to come home again. So how, so how long were you in hiding, Yolanda? A couple of years then? If you count the mountains as from the age of six and a half to the age of ten, I was about eight when I went into hiding with my godparents and later when my godparents became fugitives just like us for having hidden Jews, for having hidden us. Then I moved in with my parents briefly. They presented me as their niece. They made up a story about my mother who was in the hospital with a cancer surgery and so on. Then my godfather was a fugitive, so he came to hide with the hidden Jews. Now who was he? He was younger and handsome. And my father, to explain away why he didn't mix and talk too much to the neighbors, was presented as pathologically jealous of his younger, pretty wife, my mother. And so the story was that she didn't mix and, you know, and chat with the neighbor ladies and so on because her husband was so pathologically jealous of her. Well, of course, all of that was fiction, but when my godfather needed a place to hide, we had to stage a, a street scene where I'm, I'm, he's walking very slowly toward the place of our hiding, and I ran toward him, calling Daddy, Daddy, in Greek, Babaka, Babaka. And he lifted me in his arms, and, and so it was now established in the neighborhood who he was and why he was there, and the landlady finished the story by saying that his uh, wife was uh, in the hospital, he didn't know, you know, man, he didn't know how to take care of himself, and so he had to go um, and hide with his sister-in-law. Uh, and uh, he was my daddy. And then when I found a place to take me in after um, my godparents, then I was, I disappeared and they, they said that my mother was well enough that the family was back in their home and that's why I disappeared. So everything was like planned. They, you, you didn't want to let the neighbors notice anything unusual and start imagining what might be going on. You wanted to anticipate the kind of questions and puzzlements so that you, you presented the story that was convenient and safer for you. And that's what my parents did throughout their own hiding, especially after the family dispersed and the two children were given away. Um, after that, I went to another rescuing home, um, that of the widow, who was a businesswoman um, selling uh, dairy products wholesale. So she, she would sell um, yogurt and uh, cheese and butter and milk. And uh, in each case, it was like almost like my parents wanted me not to go to a place where food would be an issue. You know, it was like 
so I wouldn't like be a bird, an extra bird, and it was bad enough that that we, uh, my brother and I were, of course, uh, children that had to be given special care, and we were a certain amount of pain, but uh, the families that took us in never acted like we were a burden to them. So that's, uh, that was my second hiding home, and I was there until liberation, which was an amazing, amazing day in Athens. Um, the British liberated us with a sprinkling of Americans and French uh, troops, and uh, it was like just an unbelievable, joyous event in, in Athens. Uh, there were people that put the oriental carpets in the street for the jeeps of the liberators to r ride over, you know, to just, and they, and women who were so demure and very proper would just grab a hold of the soldiers and, and you know, hug them and, and they, uh, it was like a, a, an incredible, joyous occasion, just uh, bedlam in the streets. So um, what year did you first come to the U.S. then? I came in the, I think about 53, 1953. I was uh, out of secondary school and uh, had just won a, um, a Fulbright scholarship to study in America. Um, but it took a while for all the formalities to be processed, and so I spent a year uh, in a college division of my school, which was an American school, Pierce College, um, in the suburbs, of, in the seaside suburbs of Athens. What was your What was your first job when you came here? Well, I, I was a waitress in the school <laughs> cafeteria. <laughs> I didn't really have much of a job, but I was a little bit um, when I was offered everything, including the cost of the books. I figured I better just get the job and yeah. and shake a leg to just uh, not be, you know, like a taker and taker and taker. I just wanted to to make an effort on my own behalf. And so, so if you mean my first job after I finished school, well, I was a research chemist at Mellon Institute uh, for a while and I had gotten a master's degree in analytical chemistry after my undergraduate. And I did it in three years after. It was really a four-year uh, stint because I had had uh, one year of college in, uh, in Greece. And then um, I had three children and uh, I went back to school, um, and I got a, another master's and a PhD in sociology. <laughs> Switched fields. <laughs> oh, the, I arrived at the University of Wisconsin in Madison uh, on an afternoon train from the east, and I went to a clam bake. Uh, by the lake, the university is built around two lakes, and um, I met him at the clam bake, and he said it was a good thing my name was not Zavram because he had to go. He only remembered Yolanda, but he had to go through the directory of the summer school students <laughs> until he found. 
he found me, but my name was Avram, so it was easier. We had three children, and um, they're amazing, very decent human beings, very you have any, upstanding. you have any grandchildren? Yes, I have four granddaughters. Um, my oldest granddaughter uh, just got her baccalaureate degree cum summa cum laude. Um, no, I'm sorry, ma magna cum laude from uh, Villanova University. Um. I have three younger granddaughters who live in Evanston, Illinois. They are my daughter's children. Yolanda, what would you say one of your your favorite things to do, like today? Like, what do you like to do during the day? Well, right now, I I do my I edit um, my book. Yeah. I, uh, I really, it's, sometimes I do it because I'm very uncomfortable goofing off, and other times because I truly can't leave it alone, I want to finish it. And I have a dread, a little bit of a neurotic dread that I want that dementia or ill health of other kinds will befall me and I won't finish it. But I'm working with an editor now that I think she could finish it if necessary. It wouldn't be exactly the way I would do it, but okay, you know, it's better than not finishing. <laughs> and I'm self-publishing, I'm just not at all, I'm not too proud to do that. Um, this is my last question. Um, would you say that your experiences during World War II held you back at all in your life? No, but it made certain things, they made certain things harder. Um, I did have a great deal of help from my family, my, uh, uh, I, I had a great deal of healing help, which enabled me to get to the point where I could edit the last version of this book and not hide some of the private pain and, and uh, difficulty that I, I had experienced. But a lot of it was not conscious because the rescuers provided a cocoon within which I could operate for years. And just focusing on their heroism and their kindness and their generosity, I could get away from the, some of the pain of separations, of anxiety for, you know, and I, we, I lost a lot of my, not my immediate family, fortunately, but we lost a lot of other people. My uh, grandmother that had been to Crete with us was captured, and her, she died on the train on the way to Auschwitz. And her body and the others of the people that died in the train were thrown by the side of the road and the Germans prohibited burial of people from those wagons. So we never knew where she was thrown and, and what happened to her remains. 
I once heard about a situation where a survivor um, who died was going to be cremated, and you know, that's not the Jewish custom. You don't destroy the body. And um, the people that, there was a dispute in that family, it was in another country, uh, what to do with this person. And of course the cheaper uh, solution was to cremate the body. And, and uh, I heard there was a dispute and it had something to do with money. And it was the first time I had an opportunity to do something that symbolically um, healed some of my own sorrow for my grandmother. And uh, I was able to help that family and and it was really for me, it was really for my grandmother. I don't know if that makes any no, sense. It does. So those are all my questions for you. That was wonderful. Brian, did you get enough pictures? Did you want to snap her again? I know you like to take them before <laughs> and after. So. Don't tempt me. Can I, can I bribe you to just let me have a few on this side? <laughs> <laughs> Um, lastly, though, um, do you have any like pictures, old pictures, or anything oh, yeah. that you want well, me to take a picture a, of you holding? I have a picture of me and my doll, which I got probably as a consolation prize when my brother was born. I was, I was just, it was just before my fourth birthday, and my parents gave me a picture. My mother was a fabulous knitter and crochet. Uh, artist and she had she always made these fantastic little costumes with the booties and everything for the doll not only for me but for the doll and I need to find it I don't know I may have to show it to you on the computer I'm not sure where the original yeah. picture is I have to locate those and rescan them because uh, People that I had asked them to scan my pictures um, gave me very few DPIs. And yeah. so I cannot really publish most of them. Yeah. In addition, there's this whole rigmarole that they may be copyrighted and, you know, might violate somebody's copyright. And the publisher is very strict about that. So I. I can look for that picture and yeah. show it to you, but I don't know that I... It's on the computer, Is that what you Did need? You oh, you, you need some... You need to take Yeah, we were going to take like, a picture of, of you holding something. Is there anything else?